We're going to be starting a new series on the Book of Romans. It just happens that the songs that uh, Pat chose this morning fit in absolutely perfectly <coughs> with the <coughs> passage we're going to be looking at today, which is Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. Huh? It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? Well, it's about the gospel. That's, you know, key, resurrection, yeah, Holy Spirit, all that stuff. It's all there. It's so all packaged very neatly in Romans chapter 1. And uh, so for a good part of the rest of this year, um, when I'm preaching or when Stuart's preaching, we will be, which will be about every two weeks, we will be um, progressing through the book of Romans. Okay, I'm going to read to start with the first seven verses. If you've got a Bible, you'd probably find it helpful, or your phone or wherever, whatever you've got it on. Um, if you haven't, it's fine. <laughs> I'm sure you can listen. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 7. <coughs> Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, <coughs> who, as to his human nature, um, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, that is, Jesus Christ our Lord. There's a lot packed in there if you go through it slowly. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll do a bit more later, but let's just pause there for the moment. He's written a lot of key concepts and a lot of very important things packed in <coughs> tight in those verses. And uh, it's one of those passages that would really be very good at home to read very, very, very slowly. And every time you come to a phrase, stop, think, try and digest it, <coughs> try and pray it. We can't do all of that when we're here together, but we're going to pick up some things. Um, Paul's a servant. That's the first thing he says he is, which puts him in exactly the same category as all of us, doesn't it? We're a servant of Christ. We're a servant of God. That's why we're here. <laughs> we are not equals. We are not above anybody. We are just all here on the same level as servants. But he's got a particular job, just like all the rest of us have <coughs> particular jobs. And his particular job sounds pretty fancy. It is to be an apostle. Now, I don't have that job. And, uh, I, well, you know, some churches use the title apostles. They use it in all kinds of different ways. I've heard it used differently in different denominations. Some denominations don't use it at all because it's confusing and because it sounds like we're trying to be as good as, you know, the 12 original disciples. Um, it simply means somebody that God is calling to send out. It simply means the sent out one. Well, in some places we might call it church planters. You know, the people that go and start things. Paul certainly was one of those. The people that cross boundaries. So some people might say, oh, all well, missionaries are in that category. In different ways, they're in that category to different degrees. And obviously Paul was given a very special task to the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, which is 
unless there's anybody here who's a secret Jew, I think that's all of us. Uh, I'm not. It might be fun to be, but um, I'm not. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think the way he sees himself is just really um, healthy. First of all, a servant, and whatever I am doing is something I am simply called to do. I don't have a lot of credit involved in that. I'm simply basically in a position of obedience. That's where it starts. But what's all this about? This is because of the gospel. That probably is the key word in this section, gospel. And so then he tells us about how we get it. The key event in history that caused him and caused us to be able to proclaim the gospel is the resurrection. This is just one week past Easter, right? And, and Paul is saying that's where it starts. Yes, Jesus came, Jesus did miracles, Jesus healed people, Jesus taught really fantastically and all the rest of it. But the event that actually brings the gospel, the good news, into life and into power in people's lives is the resurrection. If it weren't for the resurrection, we'd just be sitting around saying, well, you know, uh, I've got an opinion, you've got an opinion, and yeah, let's follow Jesus. He seems to have some good opinions. But when you've got the resurrection, you've got power. You've got a whole power that is overcoming for every single deficiency in human life. So that includes uh, sin, it includes weakness, it includes sickness, it includes everything we don't like, it includes all evil, and it includes death. <coughs> death's not the enemy, death's not the end, because Jesus has already passed through that and come back to show us that he is victor over all of that. Power. The gospel is not just based on nice words, but is based on power to change our lives and also to change the lives of those who we're talking to, of those who we're praying for, those who we love, those who, like Pat, we've taught or we've interacted with along the way. Power. That's why Paul is writing the gospel of the, the book, the letter, which becomes a kind of gospel, good news, to the Roman Christians. I like the term spirit of holiness here. We normally just say Holy Spirit, and you know it just rolls off our tongues because that's what we kind of call the Holy Spirit. Spirit of holiness, that's actually what it means, the spirit of holiness. What kind of spirit is it? I've heard all kinds of weird things that people have said. The Holy Spirit said this to me and that to me. And some of them, of course, is right. But I've also heard some stuff which doesn't sound all that holy to me. And as soon as that happens, the alarm bells should go up and say, well, excuse me, <laughs> the Spirit, if it's anything but holy, then it is not the same spirit that is being talked about here that is part of the Trinity of God. Holiness is central to the character of God. A holy life was central to the character of Jesus. Holiness is central to the character of the Holy Spirit. So that's one test. If you hear anybody say the Holy Spirit said something about it, ask does this come from a spirit who's holy? You know, when, the, when people say, oh, the Holy Spirit told me I could do this, even though, you know, the church says I can't. Well, excuse me, uh, where is it? Where's the church getting this from? From the Bible. Oh, yeah, well, that's another test. <laughs> Does it fit with the Word of God? It should come from a whole lot. <coughs> so here, 
he says it's the spirit of holiness who um, declares with power Jesus to be the Son of God. That's how we know. And we've all had different experiences in our lives that have confirmed to us that this is not just a nice story. This has real truth and this truth has real power because it actually affects me. It has changed my life. We've still got to deal with sin and stuff, you know, all that stuff. But the power is there to do that. The power is there to keep walking because Jesus has risen from the dead. The Holy Spirit, the spirit of holiness has confirmed it. <clears throat> and I am in the category of having come to faith because of that same Holy Spirit. There's another phrase in here that I like. He talks about the calling people from among the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith. You know, some times people say, oh, well, you know, the, the, with the Christian Christianity, you know, the Protestant version of Christianity is just about faith. <coughs> we don't have to worry about works because, you know, those, those other churches out there, they concentrate on works. And so some people say, well, I'm a Romans Christian, you know, because this is about faith. And then somebody says, I'm a James Christian, because that's about good works. Well, we don't actually see that kind of division in the Bible. You don't see it anywhere, running from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. It's a split that is not fitting with the Holy Spirit. Can you can imagine a spirit of holiness telling you that it doesn't really matter how you live? doesn't really matter whether you live a good life or not. doesn't really matter if you do good things or not because you've just got faith. That doesn't fit to me with a spirit of holiness because holiness has also to do with holy living. It all goes together. And, and, and Paul here links them. He says obedience that comes from faith. Faith is the root but it should issue in obedience to whatever God tells us to do. And if it doesn't, then there's something wrong with our faith. So the two things are hand in hand. The root is faith, the fruit is obedience. So if you see somebody blatantly disobedient to the scriptures, blatantly then you start to think or blatantly disobedient to a holy way of thinking and acting, then there has to be a question mark asked. And there needs to be coming back to the obedience that comes through faith. And verse 7, he's writing to people in Rome. But I mean, he, just could, he could have just as well have been writing to people here, key life. To all in key to life who are loved by God, isn't that all of us? And called to be saints. Guess what? Holy people. Saints means set apart to be holy. So I can look around. We've got, you know, Saint Bev, we've got Saint Pat, we've got Saint David, two couple of Saint Davids at the back. And, you know, we've got a couple of saints sitting around here too. That's who we are. Because we have been brought into a holy relationship with God and a holy call and a holy obedience. That's who we are. I'm going to read a bit of the next section now, starting at verse 8, going down to 15. First, I thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. <clears throat> God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times 
And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. You see, this personal connection. I love that. Paul's not just preaching the gospel because, um, you know, he, it, well, he's just being blindly obedient, you know. He is passionate about preaching the gospel because he's passionate about the people. He cares about the people. If he doesn't care about the people, he's not going to be bothered preaching the gospel. We need to have our passions stirred by God and our passions stirred for the people that he puts in our path. I long to see you, he writes, so that I might impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, so that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Paul's not just somebody who's coming along saying, you know, I've got something to dump on you, I've got something to give you because I'm superior to you, you know, I know more than you do. And what he wants is to lift people up. <coughs> he wants to give them whatever he can and whatever he's called to give them, but he wants for them to be raised up so that they in turn might encourage him. They, he wants the giving to be two ways. He will give what he's called to give, but he's only a limited human being and there are ways in which God is going to be raising up these other people and they are going to be giving to Paul in different ways um, to encourage him. You know, I mean, I, we probably all have all had this experience of people that we've seen grow in faith or come to the Lord. And when they do grasp the, their <coughs> Christ, when they become, when they change, doesn't that encourage us? Doesn't it? When you start to see somebody following Jesus instead of going off on some other silly way, doesn't it do your heart good? This is what Paul is saying. It's two-way. He wants a two-way warm relationship, not just a top-down relationship. He wants to be encouraged. He knows that they need to be encouraged. And together, that, of course, is going to be part of the body of Christ, which he doesn't talk about right here, but this is it in function. That's his heart. And that's going to be our heart too. <coughs> he says, um, down in verse 14, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I read a, a challenging little um, story on Facebook put on there by a minister friend um, who was posting something he'd seen. And this was, um, I don't know how long ago this happened, but it was at Easter. And uh, this is the story of a minister in New York who, uh, I don't know if anybody else has seen this story, but he'd just been preaching his heart out at Easter about Jesus. And, uh, and there were other people on his team who were praying for those who responded to that and who wanted prayer. And so, you know, lo lots of people did. And he was, at the end of this, exhausted. And uh, I know that that can happen, because I've been there. And uh, so what he did was he just kind of sat down in a corner where he thought nobody would see him and uh, put his, his legs down over the edge of the stage and uh, just was ready to go home, go to bed, you know. And this guy, foul-smelling guy, came up to him. And first of all, he thought, oh, no. <laughs> you know, he's another wino. All he wants is some money and uh, he won't wear anything else. And, uh, you know, this guy was, he said, uh, you know, they, they had a policy they didn't give out cash. But he said, I can't be bothered with that. I just get rid of him by, you know, giving him a bit of money because I can't cope at the moment. 
anyway, this guy who smelt terrible came up and uh, he got this bit of money out to give to him, thinking that would satisfy him and he'd be off. And the guy said, I don't want money. I want Jesus, that one you've been preaching about. Well, <laughs> then, then he started to cry. He said, he realised, you know, like what had happened is, he, you know, he, in his own tiredness and in his own exhaustion and everything, and he'd made a wrong assumption, you know, I mean, it does happen. And then the, the two of them started crying, so they ended up crying together. And in that crying, this guy came to Christ. <coughs> and his life changed dramatically. He went into a detox and all of that. But, you know, I didn't need a real long time in there. And uh, came up, they scrubbed him up and, um, you know, had teeth missing and everything, they fixed that up. And, uh, you know, he thought, because first of all, he looked like he was a lot older than he, you know, subsequently found out he was. After he got cleaned out, up, um, the church gave hired him to do handyman work, which it turned out he could do. And uh, he was on his beginning to get on his feet again and to you know, live a proper life. And, uh, and then a year later, um, this minister asked this guy to share his testimony in church. And he did. <coughs> and he said when he heard this guy share his testimony, he realised he's a preacher. So at the time this article was written, they just ordained him as a minister. Sent him off to a nearby church. You know, I mean, we don't have to be feeling at our best. And we don't know when God is going to be in the business of transforming someone's life. And I really often think that there are more people seeking God than we know about, than we realise. And we tend to be afraid. We tend to think, you know, oh, they don't want to hear about this. But there are people seeking God and they're people that we know but they haven't got the right words to say it. Paul is grateful to people, for different people along his path, the Greeks and the non-Greeks, the wise and the foolish, you know, that would include the educated, the non-educated, you know, the people who smell good, the people that don't smell good, the, you know, all the different categorisations we make. We've all got preferences of the kind of people we're comfortable with. I do too. But you know, God can break down those preferences. And he does, time and time again, with surprises. And uh, then he goes on to say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's a challenging little line. Am I ever ashamed of the gospel? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, but am I ashamed to speak of it? I need to know the right timing. I need wisdom. But you know, sometimes it can end up being fear <coughs> and being ashamed. Because it is the power, that word power is coming back again. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. As all of us, everybody. We all come into that category <coughs> somewhere or another. And I, I think of just, well, I think of many people who I've seen come to Christ and just thought about how different they all were. Their circumstances were so different. And just let me tell you briefly about three. One was when I was a minister in England, and this would have been about 2007, thereabouts. Um, and uh, one Sunday we had a Chinese couple came to our church and uh, I was chatting with the husband and uh, they seemed a really nice young couple. And uh, I happened to say, are you a Christian? I knew they were from mainland China and I knew that he was a physicist in Cambridge, like a very bright man. His wife was very bright too in mathematics. And I just said, are you a Christian? He said, no, I'm not a Christian. <coughs> And I thought, well, you know, you've come to church. <laughs> so I said, uh, well, are you interested in finding out more? He said, I am. Okay, right. So would you like me to come around on Friday night? Yes, I would. 
So we did that for the next three years. <laughs> and every Friday night, I was around at their place, and we were going through the scriptures. We started with Mark's Gospel, and uh, he's a kind of a, a thinking, an intellectual kind of man. So he was asking, he was making a comparison with Chinese sayings, Chinese proverbs, and he knew his history very well, <coughs> and all that. So his, his need was an intellectual need because it didn't make sense to him what he was told about there being no God, you know. And then there were people who had, you know, God of the wood and a God of the sun and a God of this, that and the other. And he couldn't figure out how it should be. He wanted something neat, he wanted something logical. And the thing that he came across was, you know, if he was God, he would not have organised his son to come to earth in Israel. You know, in a little tiny country, in, and grow up in a little tiny village <coughs> called Nazareth. He said that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, that seems to him to be stupid. It's not a logical thing for a god to do. And uh, yet, he thought about. It. He said, he said, if I were God, I would have made Jesus come to China. In, you know, there was a great big empire there at the time. They had roads. They had means of getting the news out and all of that. And yet he'd been very, very impressed with Jesus' teaching. And, you know, he was taking his Bible to work every day in a physics lab, and he had it under his arm, a plastic bag and all of that, and so that every lunchtime he would read it. And he would, wouldn't let it go on the floor because he wanted to show it respect, but simply because of the wisdom that was there in the Gospel. So he knew there was something special there. And then we decided to look at all the way the religions have spread, you know, who's this, is, how has Islam spread, and how we went through all these different religions, because that's his kind of mind. And he said, the crazy thing is, Christianity should not have spread. And yet the facts tell me that there are more Christians around the world that have come out of this little tiny dot of a place all that tells me that some event must have caused it. Otherwise, it makes no logical sense. And that event, of course, led him to the resurrection. And at that point, he realised that he, as a clever man, could not be as clever as God because God broke all the human rules of how you do it and it worked much better than all of the things that he would have devised. So in a sense, he decided to give up his academic pride, if you like, and bow the knee to the God, God and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the Trinity. And one of the last things we did before we left there was to baptise him, which was great. The second person I'll tell you about is my father. And what his stumbling block was <coughs> that uh, he had done some things in his life that he knew from his Catholic background God would not approve of. Now, not that he ever went round repenting or anything. He just kept doing more of them. <laughs> at this, at that stage, um, but he knew. He just said that he could never dart in the door of a church. You know, the, the ceiling would caught, fall in and all that stuff, because he wasn't good enough. He wouldn't get in. So that was a different problem. And yet, when he was on his deathbed, really, uh, six weeks before he died with lung cancer, <coughs> in uh, I've forgotten the year. Crazy. Anyway, whatever year it was, it doesn't matter. He was age 76 and uh, I had come back from Canada, that's where we were living at the time, to be with my parents in Sydney. And, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was there and I had been praying, God, you know, how should I, look? he needs the gospel, you know, he needs to know. And uh, what do I do? And every day God said, no, don't say anything. 
uh, just their daughter, and then one day, which was Christmas Day, God said to die, pray with him. I thought, pray with him? My father's going to hit the roof. Like, you know, like that's, he's not going to hang around if someone's praying in his company. But anyway, that's, so that was a test for me. Would I dare to do that? And so I said a very, very simple prayer. God help him with his pain, um, forgive his sin, and give him peace. Amen. Tears coming down his face. Not the response I expected. And the next day when I walked in, he looked at the cross that was up on the wall of the Catholic hospital, and he said, supreme sacrifice. I thought, my father? And I said, well, yeah, yes, Dad. Um, you know, and I told him about how hey, you have to believe that. He said, I do believe. And I thought, I'm not so sure. But over the next six weeks, every day, Dad told me something else that God had spoken to him. Thinking, God speaking to my father. And uh, it was becoming clearer and clearer and clearer that God, in fact, did a major transformation of my father's life. And uh, when I took my Bible, <coughs> see I wasn't allowed to read a Bible, but when I took my Bible in, because he grew up with a Catholic idea, you can't read your Bible, read Psalm 23. He said, where did you get that? I said, that's in the Bible. <coughs> so he grabbed it from me, read it out loud in the hospital so that everybody, anybody around in that ward could hear it loudly big loud voice and uh, one day he said to me he said oh, I think I could be a preacher I said well yes I think you could dad because <laughs> by now he was ready to tell anybody and one of his engineer friends he was an aircraft engineer came in to see him and dad said to him you know one day there was a there was a man in Dubbo New South Wales we're in New South Wales and Dad told a story. Dad was a storyteller. And he told this story about the engineer who had made this terrible mistake with an aircraft. But the fine was paid. The fine was paid. Here's Dad passionately in hospital to his friend. The fine was paid and the engineer went free. Isn't that wonderful? And the man's standing there thinking, what is he talking about? So as I walked down the corridor with his friend, he said, do you know what he was talking about? I said, yes, this is what he was talking about. Jesus, paying the price for his sin on the cross. Dad was an evangelist. <laughs> of course, he didn't, hadn't been to church, so he didn't really know all the right words. He hadn't read the Bible apart from Psalm 23 when I came to him. But God had led him through a path of repentance. God had changed his heart. And he had tried to apologise as best he could. Change. Then I think of Betty, a lady in Canada. Grown up in a good church family, good Mennonite family. Her Mennonite surname and all of that in mean, in uh, Mennonite churches, your surname actually counts. They can connect you with, you know, oh, you're a genuine Mennonite, you know. Uh, it's crazy, but anyway, that's how it works. And uh, from Ukraine. And uh, she was in a little choir I had for Pentecost. It wasn't all that little, actually. It was a decent sized choir. And uh, she said after the first time, she said, I can't stand it that you pray. She said, I just want to sing, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to take part in anything, any prayer. I said, why? She said, I don't believe in God. I said, what? You're in church every week. You've been in church all your life, and by this stage she's in the 40s. And uh, so we did a deal, and I said, well, next week, if you want to still sing, uh, when it comes to the prayer times, we'll break up in prayer groups. 
but you come to my office instead of the prayer group. We'll talk instead. She said, all right, I'll do that. Anyway, so, um, so she came to my office and she said, I can't believe. I said, all right, okay, you can't believe. She said, why are you accepting that? You're not supposed to accept that I can't believe. You're supposed to tell me I should believe. I said, well, I can't make you believe. I'm just accepting what you're saying. This is the position. You can't believe. Okay, I accept that that's just where you are. <coughs> anyway, so when it, after we finished and um, you know, we were packing up at the end of the practice and uh, she knocked, knocked on the door, she came back. And uh, she said, I need to pray, but I can't pray. I said, I thought you didn't believe in prayer. She said, I don't. <laughs> well, who are you going to pray to? to? Well, God, she said, except I don't believe in God. <laughs> All right. I sit down. <laughs> so I said, well, can you say something like, you know, God, if you're there, you know, whatever you want to say. If just, you know, imagining that he might be there, just in case he is there, you know, say something. And uh, she did, which was a huge step. If you don't believe in God and you don't believe in prayer. But anyway, she took that step. And a couple of days later, I was not with her, but God overwhelmed her with his love. Absolutely overwhelmed her with his love. And uh, then subsequently I found out she'd had some very, very severe problems in her life. And God, one by one, just was dealing with each of those. And what happened was, everybody in the family saw the difference. Actually, the next Sunday in church, because I was, I was actually ministering two churches at the same time. She was in the other church. So she got up on Sunday and went to the microphone and she said, and this is a person who hardly said anything to anyone, and she said, I have to tell you what God has done in my life this week. And everybody was shocked. Becky, like, you know, <laughs> she's coming to talk into the microphone. What, what, what's going on? And <coughs> Betty told them with great enthusiasm of how God had revealed himself to her this week in this enormous love. It's real. And subsequently, her children were converted, and then her various family members, parents, siblings, um, the, it was like a domino effect across her family and her community and in the church. She became an elder in the church. God has power, the power of the resurrection, to transform lives. I just want to finish with. Verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous <coughs> will live by faith. That's a quote from Habakkuk. Now, I think I've spoken about Habakkuk before, but just let me give you a very quick glimpse into that. Habakkuk was struggling because there was a lot of injustice. There's a lot of bad stuff happening in his world, among his own people. You know, we sometimes struggle with the same thing. He went to God and said, well, God, can you fix it? You know, you're going to do something about this. And God said, all right, I'm going to send those nasty Babylonians and they're going to do something. And Habakkuk said, no. I don't like that answer from you, God because they're worse than my people. And God said, well, yeah, that's coming. And then Habakkuk went to him and asked him and asked him more questions about this because it didn't make sense. And he said, I stood and I watched on the ramparts and I waited for the Lord to answer me. <coughs> and the core of his answer was these words. The righteous will live by faith. Now, we run them off our tongues, but this was profound 
And even the Jewish rabbis say that these words are, they sum up everything else that's said in the 613 laws in the Old Testament. They're more <coughs> important. And of course, in the New Testament, we see that. Paul recognises that. So what does it mean? The righteous will live. This is not just about physical survival. It's talking about really living. You'll really be alive if you have faith. If you really hold on to God through no matter what difficult circumstances happen, then you will really live. And I did a little illustration with my hands, which I'm going to do again. If we could pretend that this top hand is God and this bottom hand is me or you, any of us. And between God and me, there is a string. Can you see that string in your imagination? What is it say? A bit like a plumb line. But this is one you're going to grab onto. And I'm at the bottom thinking, will I keep holding on to this or not? Is it worth holding on? You see, faith is about holding on. Who am I? What's, what, what am I holding on to? Why am I holding on to it? It's because God at the top is faithful. And that's he is the one that gives us faith because he is faithful. He's full of faith. You can count on him. He is holding the top of that string faithfully. <coughs> and it's a little bit of a play on words in Hebrew. I'm at the bottom. All I'm doing is barely holding on. But I'm holding on to the string that's connected to the one who is totally faithful. He will never, ever, ever, ever let go of that string. Never. All I'm asked to do, the righteous, the ones in right standing with God, that's us. All we're asked to do is to live, holding on to God's <coughs> faithfulness. And of course, with that comes the power of the resurrection. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for such rich words in your word. Thank you that it's freely available, and thank you for the great power that is at work in our lives, even when we feel really, really weak, <coughs> really, really unable to cope. We're not just relying on our own strength, but this resurrection has given us your access to your power and that's what we want to hold on to, Lord. <coughs> Our power is limited. And so, Father God, I pray for every person here, particularly those who are in difficult situations or wondering how they can keep holding on and they're wondering about what they're facing, wondering what they can and can't cope with. Father God, I thank you that there are other images that tell us that you are also underneath. Underneath of the everlasting arms. And so between them, Lord, I thank you that you will never, ever let us go. And I do pray special strengthening, <coughs> comforting and encouragement to those who particularly need it this day. And I pray that you will empower all of us. Open our eyes, Lord, to see those who are seeking you when we're not even looking. Open our eyes to 
C and the our ears to hear the little signals that show that people we know are searching, even if they don't know what they're searching for. Open our hearts, Lord, that we might be moved to share your gospel with your power. Holy Spirit, resurrection <coughs> power with those that you put in our paths. Um, give us the discernment to know when you are speaking and saying the time is now. Open your mouth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.